Congratulations. Don't ask me for two steps of the Evil. 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 Yeah. <laughs> 
So this is a very beautiful, very instructive, and very lengthy pastime of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So turning to the verse here that mentions his appearance. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 until they get to the verse. The original Supreme Personality got it, dressed in yellow garments, and bearing a conch shell disc, club, and lotus in four hands, then appeared before Aditi. So Aditi had performed this very elaborate ceremony called the Peo Vrata ceremony. It was an austerity that she performed under the instructions of her husband, Kushapa Muni. Why? There had been a fight that would broke out into the heavenly planets and the demons very easily because of the supreme power of Bali Maharaj and his followers were easily able to overcome the demigods. The fact that demigods didn't even fight or just left their kingdom. And now the demigods will be after their kingdom. Indra was no longer in a position to rule. And Bali took over not only the heavenly realm, but all other realms. Now, uh, seeing that Aditi, she is the mother of the demigods, many of the demigods were her, actually her sons. And so she's lamenting for the plight of her sons. At the same time, the heavenly kingdom is no longer being managed. And therefore, the rest of the universe is is also in disarray because the demons have taken over. Prabhupada goes on to explain in a general sense that this battle between Devasura, David, those who are saintly, godly, and those who are demonic or asura, is an eternal battle. It's not a battle that happens occasionally. It's a continuous, what we say, fight for the supremacy of the material energy, either to control it on behalf of the Supreme Lord, which is the duty and the service of the demigods, or to exploit it and use it for their own selfish interest, which is, the, which is the desire of the demons. So this fight goes on eternally. It's going on today. <laughs> it's not like it's something that we read about in the scriptures. It's happening right now. <laughs> And it's always happened eternally, either on different planets or in different universes, also on this planet quite regularly. And now the demigods are bereft of their kingdom. Aditi is lamenting her the flight, flight of her sons, and she wants to do something to bring it back. And therefore, she prays to her husband. He gives her the ceremony to perform. And he said, if you perform this ceremony accordingly, without deviation from the principles that after some time the Supreme Personality of Godhead will appear. Of course, this was also on the request of the demigods. And she expertly, with great attention, uh, performed this ceremony and the Supreme Lord appeared in the most, when we say, unique way. He didn't come in his book, we usually know his manifestation. He came as a little boy, a little dwarf, um, no more than, it doesn't really say how big he was, but he was small. So here it says he appears. So when the Supreme Personality of Godhead became visible to Aditi's eyes, 
Aditi was so overwhelmed by transcendental bliss that she at once stood up and then fell to the ground like a rod to offer the Lord her repeated and respectful obeisances. She stood silently with folded hands, unable to offer unable to offer suitable prayers to the Lord because of transcendental bliss. The tears filled her eyes and hairs on her body stood on end. Because she could see the Supreme Personality of Godhead face to face, she was in ecstasy and her body trembled. Then finally, after getting her composure, she started to offer beautiful prayers to the Lord, who was, as is mentioned here, the goddess, the husband of the goddess of fortune, and the source and enjoyer of all sacrificial ceremonies. And this is a prayer by Aditi. O Master, the enjoyer of all sacrificial ceremonies, O infallible and most famous person, whose name when chanted spreads all good fortune, O original supreme personality of Godhead, supreme controller, Shelter of all holy places, you are the shelter of all poor, suffering living entities, and you have appeared to diminish your suffering. Please be kind to us and spread our good fortune. So we pray to speak with him. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the master of those who observe vows and austerities, and it is he who bestows benedictions upon them. He is worshipful for the devotees throughout the devotees' life, for he never breaks his promises. In the Bhagavad Gita it says, Kotiya Patijanihi Name Bhakta Pranashyati. Krishna declares, O son of Kunti, declare boldly, my devotee never perishes. The Lord is addressed here as Achuta, the infallible, because he takes care of his devotees. Hmm. Interesting definition of a chuta. He never fails to take care of his devotees. So this is a very, uh, let me say, important part of our process of execution of devotional service. Krishna is always taking care of his devotees. In fact, he makes that his main service. Although he's receiving so many prayers, benedictions, and also. Uh, performs his activities. He likes and very much is eager to give protection to his devotees. Therefore, he takes care of his devotees. And this is very, what we say, comforting aspect of our practice of devotional service. The Lord is always with us, always protecting us. It is simply our duty to remember him. When we remember, when we remember the Lord, we can feel His protection. We can understand that He is always here. Anyone who is a miracle to the devotees is extremely vanquished by the mercy of the Lord. So He's enthusiastic to get rid of those who are miracle to His devotees. The Lord is the source of the Ganges, and therefore He is addressed here as Tirtapada. Indicated that all holy places sit as his lotus feet. Well, whatever he touches with his feet becomes a holy place. Interesting. Bhagavad Gita, for example, begins with the words Dharma Shetra Kuru Shetra. Because the Lord was pleasant on the battlefield of Kuru Shetra, it became Dharma Shetra, a place of pilgrimage. Therefore, the Pandavas, who are extremely religious, were assured of victory. Any place where the Supreme Personality of God had displays his pastimes, such as Vrindavan or Dwarka, becomes a holy place. The chanting of the holy name of the Lord, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, is pleasing to the ear and expands good fortune to the audience who hears it one chanted. Owing to the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Diti was fully assured that the troublesome condition created by her, for her, by the demons, will now soon end. 
הוא מגיע כמדען נשיא הגילה So now Mamma Dave has appeared as the son of Aditi. She is overwhelmed with loving affection, at the same time happy the Lord has appeared in order to rectify the anomaly that the demons have now taken over the world, or actually in the universe. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has manifested in his opulences, and as is described, he has six principal opulences. He is all wealth, he is all knowledge, he is all fame, he is all beauty, he is all strength, and he is also the most renounced. So in this particular incarnation of the Lord, he's manifesting himself in his opulence of beauty. When he appeared, he, a sweet little boy, more, no more than 10 or 12 years old in age, and everyone's eyes were simply, I would say, overwhelmed with happiness in seeing the beauty of the Lord. He was so beautiful. And this is one of his opulences. I think for devotees, when devotees think of their attraction to the Lord in different ways, we think mostly of his beauty, because we see it in his deity form, we see it in the beauty in his pictures, and in so many, so many ways the Lord displays his quality of beauty. So in this particular incarnation, he excelled in that manifestation. And immediately everyone wanted to give him gifts. And the demigods were there and other personalities were there. They gave him an umbrella, they gave him some copans, they gave him a gidir skin, they gave him a common daylu pot, they gave him uh, raksha beads, <laughs> they were also given. So many gifts is for pouring upon the Lord because this is one of the principles of welcoming the Lord. It says that one should try to give gifts to the Lord. <laughs> Whatever you might find suitable to offer to the Lord is an actual appropriate to do that. Prabhupada said, when you come to the temple, you should always bring something to give to the Lord. You know, some gift or something, even a flower, or just maybe a, uh, something edible, something should be offered to the Lord as a way that here I'm coming to your home and here this is, a, this is my appreciation for the fact that you are present. So, this gift giving is actually illustrated here in this particular. And the Lord, after receiving all the gifts and the prayers of all the devotees, didn't waste time. He went right to where he was supposed to go. <laughs> he went to the assembly house of uh, uh, actually, it is the ritualistic ceremony that was being conducted by uh, Bali Maharaj. Now, Bali Maharaj is the, was the king of the demons, and he was so powerful. He became powerful because he very expertly, with great attention and over a period of time, worshipped his spiritual master. And this is another interesting point. Here's where one power, here's where how one becomes powerful in devotional service. By focusing with great attention, devotion, uh, adhering very carefully with, with enthusiasm to carry out the instructions of one's spiritual master. The spiritual master is our link with Krishna. And that link is 
just as good as Krishna in the sense that he can give us Krishna. But how does he give it? He give us, gives us by giving us the guidance we need in order to practice the process of pure devotional service. And that guidance comes in the form of so many instructions and so many duties to execute. And if we follow that with enthusiasm, not just what we say, routine activity. Routine activity means you go from one thing to another and you do it. It's like when you go to work or something, you got some job to do. So you go ahead and do it. But devotional service requires that enthusiasm to, to execute the instructions with a desire to please the spiritual master with the desire to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that empowers one with great spiritual ability to execute devotional service because everything comes from above. It's a mercy, it's mercy, nothing. nothing what can we do? We can simply posi put, position ourselves to be recipients of the mercy. And that, that, that uh, positioning means to be enthusiastic in your execution of emotional service. Some people think enthusiasm means high energy, <laughs> but it's high energy in the form of intelligence. In other words, meditating on the instructions of the spiritual master and thinking of ways of how to carry it out. And that is the enthusiasm. And that's Rupa Goswami explains that enthusiasm means utsahan. Utsahan means to practice spiritual life with an intelligent understanding of how to execute the activity, with a desire to please the Lord and and of course the spiritual master. So Bali was so expert in doing that with his spiritual master Sukaracharya that he became a fulgent. <laughs> He was actually, you know, just so powerful that actually in describing this conquering of the demigods by the demons, the they, 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 demigods didn't even fight. They saw Bali and his armies and they were like so effulgent, so powerful. The demigods just picked up all their stuff and whatever they could carry and left. <laughs> they didn't even stay and fight. They knew they had no chance. So it wasn't even a fight, and Bali just walked in and took over. <laughs> he had become so empowered by worshiping his spiritual master so actually. And now, the Lord, on behalf of the demigods, has come to retrieve the uh, position of the heavenly kingdom and the rest of the universe back. So he comes into the assembly. Now, Bali has many good qualities. Although he's a demon, he simply is very inclined to Brahminical culture. Brahminical culture is the foundation for the execution of successful devotional service. Srila Prabhupada describes in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam that a society is successful if they practice three aspects. One, Brahminical culture. Two, cow protection. Cow care, not only protection, but cow care. And, uh, worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Brahminical culture is the mood and the principles by which one lives and which one, excuse me, executes their devotional service. So Bali, although he was a demon, in essence he was a demon. In other words, he was against the demigods. And he wanted to usurp the kingdom for his own aggrandizement. Still, he had a regard for Brahminical culture. It's interesting. Uh, he had that quality. And that was his saving grace. So when, when Vamana, now Vamana also came in, and he had a Brahmin thread on, a very shiny Brahmin thread. That was one of the gifts he received when he first appeared. Uh, Bali immediately turned his attention to his personality who walked in. Immediately he started to uh, welcome him. And seeing that he was a Brahmana, he greeted him with all nice words. And, of course, thanked him for coming and asked him, how can we serve you? <laughs> uh, 
this was Bali's good fortune. Now, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he didn't get right to the point. He was just sitting there and accepting the worship. And then Bali was so enthusiastic, he said, please, you have come, you are a Brahmin, I love to serve Brahmins, the Brahmins are the best of all, so please take a benediction from me. Whatever you ask, I can give. The Lord said, well, you know, what can I ask for? I'm just a little boy, what do I need? <laughs> but since you asked, uh, um, I'll just take three steps of land. Bali, when Bali heard that, he felt insulted. <laughs> Really, you're three steps. There's nothing. I'm, I'm prepared to give you much more than that. Why are you asking only three steps of land? And the Lord said something very significant, <laughs> which we can all learn from. He said, well, you know, one should be satisfied with whatever one needs and not be interested in getting more than what one needs. So he was giving that, he was giving that example, is that, just give me three steps to land, that's all I, that's all I need. <laughs> and Bali was, again, very persistent. Now Sukhachari, he's also there, and he's listening. And he's a little concerned, because he has some insight who this person really is. And so he's, he's saying to um, Bali, you know, what, what are you saying? You know, this is the Supreme Lord himself. He's going he's gonna to take everything away from you. Bali didn't even hear what his spiritual master said. He was so much enthralled or absorbed in seeing the beauty of Brahma Day and at the same time wanted to benedict that he kept being pers persistent. And Sukhacharya was thinking, well, you should, you know, you should uh, revoke your promise. And Bali said, how can I do that? I've already given my promise that I will give him whatever he asks us for. Well, Sukhacharya says, because you didn't chant Om before you made the offering, therefore you can change your offer. <laughs> In other words, you, your offer doesn't, it's not valid in terms of the actual promise itself. And, uh, but Bali didn't want to hear that. <laughs> Bali was just so much overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord. And finally, the Lord, then he said, please, all right, take your three steps. I could give you an island, I could give you a planet, I could give you whatever you want, you know, great wealth for eternity. And the Lord again enunciated that point. One who is not satisfied with what they need will never be satisfied. Interesting point. You'll see in the world today, people think that they can find satisfaction and happiness by obtaining more. Right? That's the principle of life in, in, in this Kali Yuga, is to get more and more and more. And people think that by having more, I will also find more satisfaction and find more happiness. And this moralism like it goes on as, you know, economics. In other words, buy more, get more, you know, whatever you can do, it's more. I think I was in, in America, they have this bumper sticker. It's not no more in vogue as it was years ago, he says, he who dies with the most toys wins. Kind of facetious, really. <laughs> he who dies with the most toys wins. In other words, it's saying, you know, get more and more and more, and when you die, if you have the most, you're successful. <laughs> so that's that's the that's the, the the mood of the times is to have more. Just like I drive around, you know, I go to different places. And I see that on the highways, especially in the United States of America, they have these huge warehouses, big places. You can rent and put all your stuff there. It doesn't fit in your house anymore. The garage is full. 
Now you can you can rent these huge warehouses, and they just fill them up with all of their unused stuff, and they just and you pay you know, some rent for the for the thing, and you just keep your junk there. And it's like. You know, I, I, sometimes I go to people's homes and I stay there and I can see, I'm like, God, there's no place to move. There's so much stuff. <laughs> but what do you need in Krishna consciousness? You only need three things. You need the holy name. You need prashad. And you need association with, with the lotus. That's all. And yeah, maybe a place to stay. <laughs> That's also there too, but uh, nowadays, it, and it's propagated as the, the way of success in life is to have more and more and more. So Vamadev was teaching that principle. Bali had everything. He had uh, he had all the three realms. There are three realms of existence: the higher planetary systems, the middle planets, and the lower planets. And in those, there are 17 planetary systems that form, sorry, 14 planetary sections within those three realms that comprise the entire material existence, which is vast. You know, it's, it's unmeasurable. All of the wealth that Bali had, compared to what people have today, it would look like now everybody would be a pauper. But, Bali had so much, he had conquered everything, and he was everything was under his control. And so when Vamana Dev asked, Bali <coughs> said, three steps? That's all? All right, take your three steps. Now, of course, Sukhacharya is really nervous. <laughs> Because he's a particular type of spiritual master who lives on the wealth of his disciple. He was getting everything he needed from Bali, and therefore he was thinking, this is Vishnu, and he was said it, and Vishnu's come to take everything away. What will happen to me? That was his main concern. What will happen to me? But there's an interesting little pastime that I don't really know it, but it's a, I've heard it one time. It was spoken by Jai Pataka Maharaj <coughs> years ago. How we see before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement started to flourish in the Western countries with Bhakti Vinoda Kaur and then Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and then of course our, our Srila Prabhupada. It was 150 years where Lord Chaitanya's movement was completely lost. And that was due to this particular pastime of Ramana Day. What happened was when uh, Bali was going to enunciate the promise he made by taking water from his water pot to consummate the Sukracharya changed his form into a little fly to block the hole of the pot so the water could not come out. But it mentions that what happened was, I believe it was Vamanadeva or someone took a straw and hit that fly and punctured the eye of the fly and the fly became blinded. And because of that, there was a curse that, because of that, that curse manifested in the form of Lord Chaitanya's movement was, was gone for 150 years after all of Lord Chaitanya's uh, followers had left the planet. It was only Bhakti Vinod Thakur in the early 1800s who brought it back. It's an interesting story how that happened. So Sukracharya did everything he could within his power to stop this promise by his disciple Bali, but it didn't work. And then the Lord proceeded to carry out his activity. And with the first step, he took the lower planetary systems and the middle planetary system. 
With his second step, he took the higher plane of tennis. Now he had taken everything away. He expanded his foot huge. He's another name for Lama Davis Trivikram. Three, trying to three steps. And so in those first two steps, there was nothing left. And now, I mean, the Lord expanded his form into this huge, gigantic form. His foot, when he went up to the heavenly planets, Brahma came out of his abode, took his Kamadeva pot and started washing the foot of Brahma today. And that water later on merged with the water, which was later to become the Ganges. So that's why, that's why they say the, the lotus feet of the Lord is immersed within the Ganga water. And that was due to Brahma washing in Ramana's foot when it went up to the higher planetary system. And so now the Lord took two steps and he turned to Bali and said, you, you promised me three. What do I do now? You're a thief. <laughs> You're punishable. You offered me three steps on the Brahman, and now you can't fulfill your desire. Bali was lost. He didn't know what to do. At that time, um, Virochan, who was the, uh, no, Virochan was the father of Bali. Virochan was the son of Prahlad Maharaj. And Prahlad Maharaj appeared in the assembly. And Prahlad Maharaj, when, he, when Bali saw his, his worshipful grandfather, Prahlad Maharaj, he offered oasises and nice prayers, although he was in a very awkward position. And because he did that, he had, well, first what happened was, the Lord said, you haven't fulfilled your promise, therefore you should be arrested. So the Lord called for the, the ropes of Vaisuki, Vaisuki which is a, a snake-like form, and they tied him up, and Bali was like, a, like an ordinary prisoner. But he was happy, because <laughs> he was tied up by the Lord. <laughs> and, but he still, he wasn't able to fulfill that third promise. And so now when he saw his grandfather, he started offering prayers. And then, when that happened, he became knowledgeable of what to do. Before he couldn't think, what should I do? Here I am being subjugated. And the Lord is displeased with me and being punished. And he's demanding my the third step. But when he worshipped his grandfather, who was a pure devotee, obviously, he uh, got the got the knowledge, and what he did, he said, "My dear Lord, please place your third step on my head." <laughs> and when that happened, uh, the Lord was so pleased because he was waiting for that. The Lord was waiting. And then, in other words, he came to full surrender. So the lotus feet of the Lord represents pure devotional service. The lotus feet of the Lord represents full surrender to the Lord. And so when Bali did that, the Lord was completely happy and placed his foot, third step on the head of Bali. And he was pleased. Uh, and Bali was also happy. And the Lord was so happy with Bali that he, when he surrendered everything, the Lord decided to actually give him something in exchange of his complete surrender. You can imagine, you know, it's not hard, it's not, maybe it's not possible to imagine. Bali had everything. He had, he had all the wealth, all the control, all the allegiance, yeah, everywhere. And all of a sudden, he has nothing. <laughs> But then again, when he surrendered to the Lord, he realized that, that everything he had before was insignificant. And this is a very important point to understand that, that what is the real wealth, real wealth is devotional service. 
people determine wealth by how many things they have or how much money they have, how much influence they have over others, or maybe how much achievements they've done in their life. They consider this to be their success in life. Um, but real wealth or real success in life is to be situated in devotional service. Why? Because that is the constitutional nature of all souls. And therefore, one who is fixed in that understanding and has accepted that as the goal of life, everything is there. Sometimes devotees think, well, if I surrender everything, what will I get? <laughs> You know, I, you know, you know it's, there's a little bit for me and some for God too, you know, 50-50. No, <laughs> it's not that we have to give up anything. We have to give up the proprietorship of everything. That's the idea. That, that nothing belongs to me because everything has been given to me by the Supreme Personality of God. Now people worship the Lord, and this is very common. People worship the Lord to, in these days in order to further their materials in life. Rupam Dehi, Janam Dehi, Yaso Dehi, Danam Dehi, Dehi. What does Dehi mean? Hmm? Dehi. To get, and de dehi means come on, where is it? Dehi means you know, yeah, dehi means upam devi, give me a nice, you know, beautiful form. Yeso dehi means give me fame. Danam dehi means give me wealth. Janam dehi means give me followers. And what does Chaitanya Mahaprabhu say? Nadanam, Najanam, Masundaram, Tavikam Raja, Gadisha, Kala. He's saying all of these things have no value. What, what's real value? Janmani, Janmani, Ishwari, Ravate, Bhakti. Ahoy to keep Vaiva. Devotional service, not only in this life, but eternally in any situation, even if I have to come back in another life. That's my desire. Simply let me become your devotee. So to become a devotee of the Lord is not an easy thing. It's a very exalted position. One time the devotees were talking to Srila Prabhupada and they said to Prabhupada, Oh Prabhupada, you are the best of all devotees. Prabhupada, oh devotee, that's very high. <laughs> very high. <laughs> to be, we use that word quite ordinarily and loosely in the same devotee, but actually to be a devotee of the Lord means to be in the highest position because Krishna says uh, the devotees are in my heart and I am in the heart of my devotees. I know no one but my devotees and my devotees know no one but me. One becomes intimately connected to the Lord when one becomes a devotee of the Lord. And for the, devotee, for the Lord, his devotees are the most important, as is mentioned. And so Bali achieved success in life, he was willing to sacrifice, of course, originally unknowingly, but once he realized that he had given everything to the Supreme Personality of God, he was happy. He was happy. He never lamented his, his fate. He was actually happy because he understood, now I have achieved success in life. Although he was the king of the demons, um, he was ultimately against God and the demigods. Still, when he uh, when he achieved the mercy of the Supreme Personality of God, everything changed. Everything changed. And the Lord was so happy that the Lord actually gave him a situation which was quite exalted. He gave him a place in the lower planetary systems and the, the place called Sutta, where Bali, where the Lord would become his doorkeeper. In other words, the Lord actually manifested himself as his, the personal servant of Bali. 
the Lord was so pleased with Bali and Mahajano Yenakatasa Panta. And there are 12 persons who are qualified to teach eternal religious principles. That means they can teach devotional service. They are leaders in the categories of giving instructions on how to execute devotional service. And one of them is Bali. He's one of the Mahajans. So although coming from a demonic, demonic background, simply by being transformed by the association and by the service of the Lord, he becomes such a great personality that we worship him as one of the persons who we can take instructions from him. And he represents uh, surrendering everything to the Supreme Personality of God. So one time one devotee said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, oh Prabhupada, I want to give up everything. I said, what do you have to give up? Nothing, nothing's yours anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the conception that anything belongs to me is, is what is called a full sense of understanding. Nothing belongs to me. Not even our bodies. The body is given to us by the Supreme Lord through our parents. So that belongs to the Lord. So what do we have that's ours? We have service to the Lord, that's all. <laughs> we exist because of Him, and everything we have is because of Him. Everything we can do is because of Him. Everything we... In other words, all aspects of life are under the control of the Supreme Personality of God. So one who, one who comes to that kind of understanding is free, is happy. There's, there's a great happiness that comes when you realize nothing belongs to me. But whatever Krishna has given us, whatever the Lord has given us, we can use it to live nicely, but at the same time, use it in his devotional, in devotional service. And that is the perfection of life. And the materialists, they're miserable. Mm -hmm. You just look at people, you can see how miserable they are. Because they're always in anxiety about what they don't have or what they have and is not giving them what they want. That's material life. People are wanting to get something or achieve something or be something. And they get some some enthusiasm in order to, to, to accomplish what they want. But it doesn't give them satisfaction. Why? Because it's contrary to our nature. We cannot be happy with anything material. Because we are spiritual beings. We can use material things in the service of the Lord. And that becomes our, what we say, our saving grace. In other words, what can we give the Lord? You can give the Lord your love and your devotion, and that's what He wants. But in order to do that, you have to do that in a form of offering something to the Lord. That's why Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Patram Pushram Talam Tayam Yomi Bhakti Pranasiti Talam Bhakti Uparitam Asnami Prayatat Manaha Just offer me a leaf, flower, fruit, and water. Now you can do that, but if you're a millionaire and you think, oh, I'm just getting a flower and a leaf, Krishna says, hmm, what are you keeping for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cheating. <laughs> There's a story in the Christian tradition where in, uh, when Christ was in a small assembly with some followers and one of his, uh, well, one old lady had come. She was a very poor old lady. And also one rich man had also come. So they were giving gifts to Christ. And so one rich man, he gave a, a gift of like something equivalent to a hundred euros, something like that. And the poor lady, she gave something equivalent to like one euro or something. And uh, everyone was just appraising this man who gave such a large, but Christ straightened everything out. He said for him to give that there was no sacrifice. But for her to give that one small little, she would have to go without something for her personal needs. 
she made the real sacrifice. In other words, one, yeah, although Krishna does say that, you know, offer the flower and water, but we should also understand that we should give as much as we can. <laughs> as much as we can. Because everything belongs to Him. And you'll find that the more you give, the more Krishna gives you other things to give. It's a fact. Mm. Yeah, some of our devotees have explained in their own personal experience how that the more they give, the more Krishna arranges to give them more. If you give your intelligence, you get more. You, you give your time, you get more. You give your energy, you get more. You give your resources, that also comes. Why? Because Krishna says, oh, they know how to do things. So let me give them, a, give them more so they can offer more. Yeah, Krishna does that. So Bali, he, there was nothing left, but he was happy. Why? Because he got the lotus feet of the Lord on his head and became a great personality because of that. So this particular pastime is very instructive. It's quite long. It takes up so many chapters in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And there are many interesting points in there, especially you'll see the, the, the dialogue between Sukhacharya and Bali. It's quite interesting because it says that one cannot disobey the instructions of the spiritual master. So Bali did that. He disobeyed his spiritual master's instructions, but only because they were contrary to the instructions of the Supreme Personality of God. In other words, he took a higher principle. And that was a rare occasion. That usually doesn't happen. Because Prabhupada makes this point in that to disobey the instructions of the spiritual master makes one fallen. And therefore one pretty much has lost their footing in devotional service. But because Bali understood to worship the Lord is the highest, and if my spiritual master tells me not to worship the Lord, then he's no longer... Uh, qualified to be in that position as a spiritual master. So that was the case in this case. You know, mm -hmm. Sukracharya was simply thinking of his own interest and not of the interest of the Lord or of the interest of his disciple Bali Maharaj. This is a very interesting pastime. And Sukracharya also says one thing that's interesting also. He said, because you didn't chant Om before you made the uh, promise, therefore you can change. But Bali says, you know, how can I lie? You know, I had given my promise, now I'll be known as a liar. And there's one verse, I think, in the chapter, so I can't remember the chapter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting verse. He says, yeah, I do not fear being deprived of all my possessions, living in hellish life, being arrested for poverty by the ropes of Varuna, or being punished by you as much as I fear defamation. Although a father, mother, brother, or friend may sometimes punish one as a well-wisher, they never punish their subordinates like this. But because you are the most worshipping Lord, I regard your punishment you have given me as the most exalted. This goes back to the previous chapter. Well, it says that uh, when Bob, when Sukhacharya was trying to encourage him to give up 
to lie to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Well, here it says here. When Bali says, I am the grandson of Maharaj Prahlad, how can I withdraw my promise? Because of greed for money, when I have already said that I shall give this land, how can I behave like an ordinary cheater, especially towards a Brahmana? And this is in the next verse here, it's very interesting. There is more, nothing more sinful than untruthfulness. Interesting. There's nothing more sinful than that. Because of, because of this, Mother Earth once said, I can bear any heavy thing except a person who was a liar. It's a short purport. Prabhupada explains, on the surface of the earth there are many great mountains and oceans and they are very heavy. And Mother Earth has no difficulty carrying them. But she feels very much overburdened when she carries even one person who is a liar. It is said in Kali Yuga, lying is a common affair. Even in the most common dealings, people are accustomed to speak so many lies. No one is freed from the sinful reactions of speaking lies under the circumstances. One can just imagine how this has overburdened the earth and indeed the entire universe. Now, lying is a common thing, as Prabhupada mentions here. And people will say anything in order to further their own interests. So we can understand that because of that, the, the earth is undergoing much tribulation. And therefore, there are so many natural disasters, calamities given by Mother Earth in reactions to the sinful activities of the conditioned souls. Because Mother Earth is both the she is the provider and she is the withholder and she is also the chastiser. <laughs> she does it on behalf of the Supreme Lord. And therefore when people are sinful, they get punished through material energy. And when they are pious, they get what we say, material success and benefits. And when they're when they are devotional, then they then they are they are situated in their constitutional position. So it's an interest. This is a very uh, interesting pastime because it has so much philosophical teachings that we can all benefit from. So this is a little bit about this particular pastime, and of course. Um, then uh, we read on how the Lord actually became the doorkeeper of Bali Maharaj in Sutala, Suta, one of the lower planets. It's a subterranean heavenly planet. Although it's below the earth, it is still very opulent. And Bali lives there even today. And the Lord performs the service of opening his door for him when he comes. So the Lord shows his gratefulness to his devotees by becoming the servant of his devotees. Of course, the devotees don't like that so much. But they want the Lord to be, they want to serve the Lord. There is that story in, in Sri Vrindavan Dham when uh, it was Sanatana Goswami's birthday. And Srila Rupa Goswami wanted to honor his older brother on his birthday. Well, he wanted to cook a feast. But living as a mendicant in Vrindavan, he had nothing. Now well, he was thinking, how can I cook a feast for my brother? I have nothing. And just when he was thinking that, this beautiful little girl came along. He said, hey, Baba, I got some milk for you. I got some rice. Got some vodka. Here, take it and make something nice. <laughs> so he was so happy. Beautiful little girl. Anyway, he didn't give her much attention because he was so happy to receive the gifts. He thanked her and he performed his, you know, he cooked some sweet rice for Sanatana Goswami. 
in the evening time he offered him as a gift on his birthday. And so Sanatya Goswami was so happy to receive the gift from his brother. But then when he was tasting it, he said, how did you do this? We have nothing. Where did you get all these ingredients? How did you arrange this? And then he, he said, he said, well, this, you know, this young girl, she just, I want to make something nice for you. And, was, and he describes the girl, and then Sanatya Goswami said, oh, this is not good. We have accepted service from Srimati Radharani. We should be serving Srimati Radharani instead of accepting service from her. So he mildly chastised him in that way. So this is the mood of a devotee. devotee doesn't want to serve the Lord. I mean, you want to be served by the Lord, wants to serve the Lord. But the, the, the Lord wants to serve his devotee. So, therefore, when you become a devotee, you have to be careful, because Krishna will figure out ways to do things for you. That's Krishna. He likes to serve his devotees. And so Bali was an example of how he pleased the Lord so much that the Lord actually agreed to become his doorkeeper. Okay, so today is a wonderful opportunity to remember the Supreme Personality of God. And the more we remember the Lord, the more we are fixed in devotion to the Lord. And uh, but please, if you haven't, of course, it's already late, but you can always do it tomorrow and read this pastime. It's a wonderful pastime. It's, it's full of many, many important principles, and it shows how the Lord knows exactly how to treat his devotee in such a way that the devotee becomes, how do you say, exalted in devotional service. Very gracious. Thank you. Any comments or questions, Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful very powerful. Um, I was just thinking of um, at the beginning you were mentioning about the devotees um, the and the demons. There's always something going on. Or is that the devotees do? Very good. It's mentioned in the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says that. I was thinking that um, uh, or a devotee can somehow, even when these things are going on, if we know what's going on in the world today, so somehow we kind of, we kind of, the devotee kind of is tolerating it or is, is not really kind of reacting to it so much. Um, but on the other hand, we've seen the devotee. Um, Sometimes it's always tested by Maya. And I don't know, well, there's one example when Sri Prabhupada, when, when he got the, the heart attack for the boys, just saying, Sri Prabhupada, why is this happening when you're a you're very devotee? And then, but then he, oh, he said something like that, uh, when you, I think he said two different things, like that, but one thing he said is that but when you're doing something for Krishna, uh, so Maya, Maya sometimes attacks, you know. So, yeah. I'm not just trying to get that, that, you know, there's the body thing, there's the chemicals and the things that's going on, but then there's Maya as another kind of... For a pure devotee, these apparent attacks or the apparent reverses are actually opportunities to glorify the pure devotee. For those who are, who are not on that platform of pure devotional service, these are opportunities to become purified. Or to, to understand deeper how to surrender to the world. The features of knowledge, features of detachment for generally for us. But everything is auspicious for a devotee because the devotee is always on the care of the internal energy. So even if Krishna allows Maya to attack or we do something to invite Maya, either way, um, still we can benefit from that. We can learn from something. If we simply see the situation as, as it is and not reflect upon 
why the allow the Lord is allowing that, or why what can I learn from this? Or what what can I how can I become more Krishna conscious because of this? When we think like that and then we start to understand there's something beneficial in everything that happens to the world. But usually we're more spontaneously reacting to the situation without thinking that. But everything happens and there's a reason why. And Maya will test you. And I felt that the like Maya is always putting, he uses the word stumbling block. That's the word called for Something that causes us to can cause us to fall. But you'll never fall if you always remember Krishna. So when we forget Krishna and then we fall. But then we're then we're subjected to a situation which could cause us to fall. When we forget Krishna. In other words, we're open. As soon as you remember Krishna, you, you can't fall. As soon as you forget, then the possibility of slipping in devotional service then it becomes impossible at that time. So that's why we say, Satatam Kirtanam Tamam, always remember Krishna. And that we have to practice that. Baba said, you have to think of something. Why not think of Krishna? And some people think, well, how am I going to get my work done? No worry, it'll go on. <laughs> it's not like you can't do things because you remember Krishna. In fact, you're remembering Krishna makes everything easier and more clearer. Yes. Hello. Hello. I, you know, I, I remember you really well, but I forgot your name. Ananda Hari. Uh, Ananda Hari. Ananda Hari. Ananda Hari. Okay. I just wanted to add, at the beginning, when you were talking about the demons becoming effulgent and because of worshiping the spiritual master, so um, that was Bhavan should be really effulgent. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting because the pastime is connected to when they churned the ocean and the, the boat and the demigods got the nectar. Mm. Yet Bali Maharaj very quickly became more powerful than them, even though they got the nectar and the demons didn't get the nectar. So even by worshipping a an inferior spiritual master, they Bali obviously he was powerful anyway, but he became so powerful. And uh, I'm just thinking of all the devotees worshipping Prabhupada, who's the perfect spiritual master in time, mm. how powerful they will become. Yeah, you're seeing it today. Look at the things that are going on in the world as far as how certain amazing projects are exploding. I mean, a couple of very planetarium, I mean, and by worshipping Lord Dikananda and Lord Chaitanya, under the guidance of Prabhupada, and this, this building has come. That's just one of many things that are happening. Look how many books we've distributed. More than, in count, almost 600 million books. That's what we counted. What we didn't count, you can probably say it's almost double. <laughs> Yeah, so how many books have we distributed in such a short amount of time, 55 years or so? Yeah, so the devotees are doing some amazing things. And this movement is still spreading, even after Srila Prabhupada has disappeared now for how many years, 40 years now? Yeah, it was 
Понятно. I think each devotee can testify to their own and how their life has, you know, changed ever since they became a devotee. Is that okay? Yeah. I like to. Sati. Oh. Uh, Me uh, breastfeeding, and then. Uh, oh, that was Bali Maharaj's sister. Sister, yes. Yeah. Then the therapy, I can get that attention sometime in the future when she came as Buddha. Right. And Krishna. Yeah, Prabhupada said, yeah. Well, Shaggy Charis mentioned that she had. She saw when she saw Bhavana Dave, she had this maternal feeling to him. And she wanted to offer her breast milk. But but then when she saw what happened, had her brother lost everything, she became angry. So between the, this mother mood and the angry mood, later she became Putin. At first I fulfilled her desire for <laughs> that. But at the same time, gave her liberation. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was his sister, yeah. Ratna something, Ratna Bali, yes, Ratna, the name was Ratna something. Yeah. So the mood that one exhibits towards the Lord helps to develop a particular relationship with the Lord. Thank you. That's good. Is there anything else? so many, and Krishna is a nephew. So she's in a very good material position. But at the same time, she's afraid of forgetting the Lord because of all of this. And she prays for the situations which will cause her to call out to Krishna. your choice if you want to go that route. <laughs> it's not like you have to pray like that. But we should pray. My dear Lord, please remind me every time I forget you. <laughs> That's a nice prayer. Uh, and the Lord will do, do that. If, if we actually sincerely always want to remember Krishna, then when we forget Krishna, Krishna will do something that will help us remember him. Or he remind us, oh, you forgot me. 
So that desire has to be there. And by remembering Krishna, as Kunti says, then no one will see birth and death in this material world. In other words, one attains to the spiritual realm. So that's our desire, is ultimately to achieve uh, pure devotion to Krishna so we don't have to come back again in this body, take birth again, and you know, start crying again, <laughs> start learning one and one is two again, two and two is four. In other words, going through life's cycles. To take birth is not a very... You can ask the ladies, those of you who have given birth to children, it's not an easy thing. Both for the child and for the mother, it's very difficult. So that's why it says one of the four miseries is birth. Okay. I mean, some lady, we were we were at a conference in Newburn Valley many years ago, and it was like a reunion of all the old devotees. And some of the ladies were talking about the old days and how they gave birth to the, their children in the barn in Newburn Valley. And one lady was describing it, it was so painful that all she thought about was death is better than this. So, yeah. So for some, it can be very, very, very harrowing experience. Prabhupada talks and not Prabhupada, but Prabhupada was with his devotees. And he was one devotee, he used to be a, a driver on an ambulance. And so they would get calls from late for women who were in labor. And um, they would take them, they would take the lady to the hospital. And the ladies would be cursing their husbands, never again. <laughs> never again. Yeah, he describes it in that way. So we don't know us guys and the, the male bodies, and we don't know what women go through, it's not an easy thing. And then the child also has to undergo much suffering, staying in that womb for seven months, nine months. Yeah. Prabhupada describes it. I mean, Bhagavatam in the fourth canto is, talks about the soul who's taking birth and within the womb of the mother and what it has to undergo. Very difficult situation. So, yeah, it's one of the four miseries birth, death, disease, and death. Unnatural to the soul's existence, natural to material existence. Well, what will always say? You are all trying to serve, you know, trying to solve problems in this world, solve this problem. No more birth, no more death, in those old age and disease. If you can solve that problem, you solve all the problems. Okay, anything else? Anyone else? It just seems it's very difficult not to forget. Now it's difficult not to forget. It's difficult, yeah. It's you know, just you know, from moment to moment, one can very easily forget. Krishna just go off and something. Well, remembering Krishna is, is a is a process of two things: developing your attraction for Krishna. Well, because if you can't remember someone, you're not attracted to. Them. It's very good. So we have to develop that attraction. And how do we develop attraction? Srimata, Svakata, Krishna, Purna, Shravana, Kirtana. By hearing about Krishna as much as possible. So today, these programs that we have in glorification of the Lord's appearance day are great opportunities to remember the Lord and develop our attraction for the Lord and to hear about the qualities of the Lord, which are very attractive. And then, we, because everyone is attracted to someone in this world who has certain attractive qualities. So but when, you go, when you come to Krishna, all the attractive qualities are there. That's why he's called Krishna. He's all attractive. 
So by hearing about Krishna, we get attracted to Krishna. And when we start serving Krishna, that attraction increases more and more. But the key is the verse before the one I quoted. And that Shu Shu Shah Shadadama Siyamasi Deva Katavachi. Shamriya Seva Vipa Purnya Seva Natirtana. By serving those that, by serving great souls, great service is, is done. And by such service one gets an affinity to hear the message of Vasudeva. By serving the devotees of the Lord, we get an attraction to hear about the Lord. And then that attraction builds. So here's the key. Try to serve the devotees. When the IG person asked me, when the team is, I don't know, how are you going to remember Krishna when I'm ty typing? If you just have a picture of Krishna in front of you, look at it, work, think about it, and just have it. Yeah, that's one way. Have a picture there. Remember the Lord of the day. Yeah, the pictures. The deities, the pictures, the devotees, all of these remind us of Krishna. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Dutch. Um, uh, I have a question um, regarding, um, for example, all the, all the events, all the ongoing fight, uh, I don't know if we can say between Devas and Asuras, or maybe with Asuras fighting between themselves. Uh, like the war, for example, what should be our standpoint, uh, our attitude? To that? Yeah, two things. Here we go. Class number two. Prabhupada <laughs> 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 well, said, build these farm communities. He said the cities won't last. The cities will be bastions for crime and and various types of, uh, you know, demonic activities. He said the future of our movement depends on these farm communities. Establish one ashram, protect cows, grow your own food. He said this will be the foundation for developing our, not only our society, but the world in general. Mm -hmm. And there's a large group of people who are not devotees who are working in that direction now. We should also be doing it. Bapa said, said 50% of my mission is incomplete. We, we haven't decided to develop this Maharashtra. He said it can only be done in the forest. And so I just I just completed a book. It's going through its final stages before printing. It's called Krishna's Way to Natural Living. And I illustrate the importance of these, these farm communities. And this is the future of the world and the future of our movement. That's one, that is the And the other thing is to spread the holy name everywhere. Haridam Sankirtan. This will push back the influence of the demoniac culture, which is growing everywhere. And Haridam everywhere. Kirtan programs, go out in the streets, do Haridam, inspire others to take up the chanting. The chanting is so powerful that nothing can stop the chanting. Not even the demons with all their armies. Because it's empowered by Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya showed that himself. When the Chankasi tried to stop the Kirtan, the Lord organized civil disobedience. And uh, he showed that he pushed back the influence of Chankasi and established the power of the sacrifice movement by that particular pastime. So, so that's what we need to do, really. More and more kirtan. And japa, of course, too, but kirtan especially. Spread it everywhere, in the cities, in the streets, in the temples, everywhere. It's going on some places like that. Just like I was in Slovenia during the whole lockdown. But we didn't stay locked down. We defied the orders. We went out on Harinam Sankirtan. 
We were restricted, but still we could kept care time going. Even through the winter time, we did very long sample time. And it was good because a lot of people were thanking us for you know, coming out. Because people were really fearful about what was happening. But when they saw the devotees, they, they saw something else. So this Harinam Sankata is the Yuga Dharma. Krishna Varna Tusa Krishna Sangha Bhanga Siparshita. Yagyai Sankirtana Prayan Hiryanti Visamarasana. And this is the this is this is why Lord Chaitanya has come to inaugurate the Sankirtana. So two things from the practical social uh, point of view, establish these farm communities. For the, from the spiritual point of view, spread the holy name everywhere. And with the Maniac culture, it has no it has no substance. Sinful life has no substance. It's just it's a bad dream. We have to break through it with something that has substance. Now people are lost. People are fearful because they don't know what their future is going to be. So we have the formula. We develop these farm communities. I think Marty is working on this project right now. You know, or speak to Mono and see what you can do to help build these farm communities. Because uh, they are the future of the world and the future of, the, of our society. Then you can grow your own food, you can have I mean, the benefits of living in that lifestyle are unlimited. But we're so used to plugging in our, you know, or whatever else we plug in. It's the easy way of life, but this is not going to last. Prabhupada said in 1973, he said, in 50 years this, this Western civilization will be finished. So count 50 from 1973, what do you get? Almost there. 2023. So he said, yeah, he said this whole civilization will collapse. He said, why? And you can see it's on video how I talk about it. So because it's based on a false premise, it's based on money. The money cannot carry a civilization. Culture is what makes life, not money. Money is just some way of manipulating things. That some of Think about it. I'm not a doomsday prophet. But the signs are on the horizon. And Prabhupada's words are prophetic. He said it, get these farm communities together. And devotees are doing it. And now uh, it's slowly but not fast enough. He said your paper money will be useless after some time. He said you can put in your pillow and just use it. <laughs> for a sleeping eye. It's awfully really good for it. So, yeah, there is a lot of initiative in that direction. So we also have to think about it in our own areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you should give up your present situation and go to the farms. I'm saying you should be prepared to and at the same time, prepare for that lifestyle by building these farms. How do you go? You have to go? Like, yeah, it was a little bit late tonight. Okay. So, um, don't worry. Krishna will protect the devotees if you stay fixed in your Krishna consciousness. And that means chant. Yeah, not chance, we chant 16 rounds because we're supposed to, but we should be chanting as much as possible. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you for the class. So, um, my question is that.
sometimes when you are just initializing your journey like you are just starting with the krishna consciousness and something bad happens instead of you know just believing in krishna you sometimes are fearful of krishna that you know what if you don't worship him then something bad can again happen or sometimes you are angry you know that you know you just started and then something bad happens so how to deal with that well it's hard to say bad and good is according to our own understanding what's good for some people is bad for some others and what's bad for some others is good for others so what we can as the bodies we can take advantage of any situation and learn from that so apparently bad and good is opportunities for trying to see krishna more that's why we were talking about Queen Kunti's prayers. She's asking for, for calamities to happen more because she wants to remember Krishna. So we see bad and good in a certain way, but Krishna sees them in a different way. And how do we might judge what we like, and if we don't get it, it's bad, or if we get something we don't like, it's bad. But it may also be good when you get to connect it with Krishna. Depends how you see it. But when we first join Krishna consciousness, we're not able to, you know, distinguish in that way. But the best thing is if something apparently, and I use the word apparently bad, just say, my dear Lord, how can I, how can I understand this situation? And if you sincerely try, you'll, you'll get the answer. Why is it happening? What is the purpose of it? But in for a devotee, nothing's bad. Difficulties, yes, but bad, bad means something that defeats you. You can't be defeated as long as you stay, stay close to Krishna. You're always in the best position. But it's like a war. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. But if you stay in the battle, you ultimately win. And Prabhupada says, you know, when you take up Krishna consciousness, Maya will test you. She'll make things difficult for you. Or she'll take away things you're attached to. Give, put, put you face to face with things that are hard to deal with. Just to, to see how strong you are when you can take shelter of Krishna and remember Krishna in these situations. The whole problem is to become Krishna conscious. So the means will support the ends when the when the ends are simply I want to become Krishna conscious. I want to develop my love for Krishna. And everything that happens can will work in that direction. Apparently good or apparently bad. You see that even in the world. Some people get something that they, that they, they like and it turns to be something else. It turns into something that, that defeats them and causes them suffering. For instance, people win the lottery, they win a lot of money. And then what happens? They take the sinful activities, people try to steal their money. There was a survey. They did. They did a follow-up survey of people who won the lottery. Most of their lives went down. They're thinking, oh, I got rich all of a sudden. When something else happened. Why? Because they don't, you know, the money became the source of the suffering. People tried to kill them for it. Uh, so many things happen. So how can, what, what's actually good and what's actually bad? That's why Krishna and Marche Kandi said, Bhadra, Bhadra, what is he saying? Bhadra, Abhadra, Sakale, Samana, Hey, Manda, Hey, Baba. Uh, some people say this is good, and some people say this is bad. I say in the material world everything is bad. <laughs> it's 
Satan in the front So what is good? What connects us to Krishna and what is bad takes us away from Krishna. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Just remember Krishna. <laughs> You'll be happy. <laughs> no matter what happens. <laughs> Okay, I think we're moving into the later part of the evening. So thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah.